Hello, family. Hello, hello, hello. Good evening, good evening, everybody. Let's start sharing the live broadcast. Let's like and share. Yeah, that's better. Everybody on Facebook, everybody on YouTube, I know it's a surprise you're not used to seeing me in the night time, but this is a glorious time. We're going to get into some Bible study this evening. Come on, somebody. Let's share the live and let's keep tapping. Come on, somebody. Let's do this. Let's do this, family. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Let's make sure we are... Hey, hey, Owen. How you doing? How you doing? How you doing? Come on, Facebook people and YouTube. Let's catch up. Let's catch up. Good evening, everybody. As you are coming in, let's make sure we are tapping on the screen. Let's show, share at least with at least 10 people. Surely you can get 10 souls for Jesus tonight. Hallelujah. Good evening. Surprise, surprise. I'm the one who's doing the word study today. Hallelujah. <laughs> you never know what the Lord has in store, right? As you're coming in, please tell me which country you are coming in from. We are going to get into the Bible study today. Those of you who are on Facebook and YouTube, I think you're already seeing the title of today's message is Hindrances to the Lifestyle of Prayer. Somebody ask uh, your neighbor, why are your prayers not being answered? Amen. But please, before we get to do that, let's announce the countries we are tuning in from. Where are you watching me from? Come on, somebody. Talk to me. Where are you watching from? Today is Bible study. We're going to get into the word. We're going to get into the word. Everybody, let me know what country are you tuning in from? What country are you tuning in from? Great stuff, guys. Have you all shared? If you don't want to share with 10, at least share with two. Share with two. Let's populate heaven. Let's populate the kingdom of God. Let's depopulate hell. Let's do everything possible. Talk to me, somebody. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Awesome. South Africa is saying there, my prayers will be answered. Ethiopia is saying, my prayers will be answered. Durban, I see you. Uganda, I see you. United States of America, I see you. Soweto Shiawelo is saying, I am here and I'm going to get my prayers answered. Not by Kodi Soto Kodi Thank you, Zakes. Thank you for everybody who is joining in on the family in Jesus' mighty name. Somebody say in the comment section, my prayers shall be answered. Somebody please help me type in the comment section and say my prayers shall be answered somebody declare my prayers shall be answered my prayers shall be answered we're going to get into a word study and we're going to pray a little bit at the end but my whole point of being here tonight is to take over the bible study of this evening amen it's good to see you somebody say my prayers shall be answered my prayers shall be answered blessed evening snake i see you on facebook thank you so much for joining in Hallelujah. My prayers shall be answered. Hallelujah. Can we declare it together? My prayers shall be answered. Amen. Hallelujah. As I said, today we are going to be focusing on a word study. We are going to get into some teaching. Hallelujah. And the subject of tonight's teaching is hindrances to the lifestyle of prayer there is an expectation that we have to have a lifestyle of prayer and we're going to look into why other people are hindered in terms of leading that lifestyle of prayer so i don't know what condition your lifestyle of prayer is hey glitz and lama god bless you thank you so much for joining my prayers shall be answered therefore if there are answers that are not coming to our set our prayers we need to examine and find out what is it what is that thing that is hindering our prayers being answered amen hallelujah hallelujah somebody i want to kick off with the the let me just make sure that um facebook and youtube also sees my face thank you so much god bless you guys one of the things that we need to appreciate as children of god is that prayer is one of the greatest privileges that god has given to us right God has given to us that privilege. Somebody said in the comment section, guys, those of you who are new to my broadcast, please remember we preach together, we teach together, we pray together. Make sure that everybody else who is joining us later understands exactly where we are so that they flow with the topic. I don't want anybody to be out of tune. Hallelujah. I'm going to be teaching principally today because I need everybody to understand how prayer works and why prayers don't get, don't get answered so that they can deal with the issue at hand. Amen. 
my prayers shall be answered in Jesus' mighty name. So we need to understand as a, as a departure point that prayer is one of the greatest privileges that God has given to us to communicate with him. And prayer shapes both history and our destiny. So if our destiny... Uh, uh, is to be successful or is to, to, to happen, we need to understand that it's on the basis and the foundation of prayer. And prayer is one of the most potent forces that exist on earth and we need to utilize prayer. Can you tell your neighbor you must pray? Tell your neighbor you must pray, hallelujah. So we begin to understand that prayer is a tool that changes both times and seasons, hallelujah. And tonight we are going to principally be focusing and checking what are the factors that hinder effective prayer? What is the factors that are hindering productive praying? Why is my prayer life not productive? Most people know about prayer. They know that they have to pray. Most people think they are praying, but they, or they assume that everybody's praying, but not everybody's praying. Few people pray other people just decide to send out instructions and say pray for me but don't they don't want to pray you must pray yes pindi you must pray we need to understand that prayer is a personal and an individual responsibility we cannot hand over that you know Whatever the challenge you may be going through you can't just decide that you are just giving up and you're just going to send out prayer requests amen so what I've discovered is that few people pray and those that are few that pray, they don't pray effectively and they don't ex experience productivity. So when you are praying, you need to make sure that you are praying effectively and you are praying productively, right? So this is because there are hindrances that make your prayer life non-effective and the hindrances that make your prayer life non-productive. And that is what we are going to delve into more in deeper, uh, uh, in a deeper dimension on that. So you hear a lot of people that say, my prayers are not being answered, or I'm waiting for God to answer my prayers. But I want us to, to move from the premise that from tonight, by the end of the broadcast, we make a pact to understand that we're going to pray, right? We're going to adopt a lifestyle of prayer. God tells us that we must pray continuously and he instructs us that we must pray about all our concerns. So if you've got a concern, you came on the live broadcast, you're saying, Pastor, I've got so many concerns in life. I've got so many issues that are bothering me, that are keeping me up. And my objective is that for the first time tonight, those of you who have not slept, you will be able to have absolute rest. But we need to understand how God works. He grants those petitions that are aligned to his will. Most of the time, people pray prayers that are not aligned to the will of God. The other day, I made a, a joke about the fact that somebody asked me to bless their relationship with their boyfriend. And that is something, obviously, that does not align with the will of God. If somebody is cohabiting, for example, or living a sinful lifestyle, but I'll go deeper into that later. So we need to understand that our petitions need to be aligned with the will of God, first and foremost, and we cannot fully comprehend God's will from an earthly viewpoint we have to sometimes people ask for god ask god for things that are outside the scope of his intentions so if you imagine god as this creator who created you for a purpose he created you um you know with a specific intention it's like somebody let me make this illustration and saying a manufacturer of a vehicle for example bmw goes into the manufacturing plant to manufacture a bmw it has a specific purpose it's a vehicle it's supposed to travel from point a to b but it's supposed to give you certain experiences and certain benefits so if you don't align yourself with the manual or how you're supposed to operate that vehicle it will obviously not function to the to the optimum of how the creator wants it to function so we cannot operate outside the scope of the intention of that bmw so a bmw for example that has been used like a tractor you can't take a bmw and take it to the farm and start putting in vegetables and expect it to still give you the same type of comfort obviously the seeds get uh, uh, scarred and, and 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 all sorts of things right so now people then begin to experience unanswered prayers because now the product is not being used for the intended use, right? Now, they start experiencing unanswered prayers. Amen, somebody. And an, an, an unanswered prayers are a problem because they raise doubts. Because people start doubting the worthiness of God. They say, I can't trust God because my prayers are not being answered. But we're going to come against it in Jesus' mighty name. Hallelujah, somebody. 
Hallelujah. Somebody say hindrances to the lifestyle of prayer. So the first thing that I'm going to discuss this evening is the attitude of self-sufficiency. The attitude of self-sufficiency. I'm trying to slow myself down because I normally speak very fast, but I know that 10 p.m. is, is a time when you normally get the teachings, uh, you know, <laughs> and I need to make sure that everybody gets the scriptures because this has to be scripturally based. So hindrances to the lifestyle of prayer. And the scripture for, the, for, 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 for this point is 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 4 to 5. So there's an attitude of self-sufficiency that can hinder your lifestyle of prayer. The attitude of self-sufficiency, right? 2 Corinthians 3 verse 4 to 5 says, And we have such trust through Christ towards God, not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think of anything as being from ourselves, but our sufficiency is from God. People who don't pray, people who, who lead prayerless lives, are people who are self-sufficient, who think that they can do it on their own. They don't see a necessity for God. They don't see why they should pray. But Paul lets us know that when you, when you begin to change your mindset and when you begin to appreciate that your sufficiency cannot be of anything else because he is your creator. He's the one that brought you in. He's the one that you can be sufficient from. He's the one that has the resources, the manual on how you are supposed to function. He's the one who's got the blueprint that will help you discover the lifestyle or the life he has intended for you. You can't operate outside God's plan. You can't operate outside of his sufficiency. But when we begin to make mankind or human beings, our spouses, our children, our mothers, we, we think that we cannot exist outside human beings. We begin to look at our partners and we are, we are thinking that if they, if they sustain us, that will be enough. No, our sufficiency has to be from God. Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 5 to 6. Jeremiah 17, 5 to 6 says, Cursed is the man who trusts in a man and makes flesh his strength. So if you are trusting on your uncle, you are what the scripture is describing in Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 5 to 6. He says, Cursed is the man. So you don't want to bring a curse onto yourself. Because if you bring a curse, if you trust in a man, you've now brought a curse onto yourself. And now your lifestyle of a prayer is hindered. Talk to me, somebody. I'm in Jeremiah 17, verse 5 to 6. Help me, help me preach so that the others can see the scriptures as well. Mara Official, are we tracking together? I need to see those comments. Um, please help me comment so that I know that my screen is not frozen that side. So the Bible says, Cursed is the man who trusts in a man and makes flesh his strength, whose heart departs from the Lord. Because what will definitely start happening, when you start trusting on human beings, you start gravitating away from trusting God. Your heart starts moving away from God. You're thinking of your own strength. You are trusting on your own physical strength. And then the Bible says, for he shall be like a shrub in the desert. That means the person who doesn't trust in God, who trusts in other human beings, talk to me, somebody. You are trusting on your uncle. You are trusting on your girlfriend. You are trusting on your wife. You will be like a shrub in the desert. I don't know how many of you have seen a shrub in the desert. It's dry. And you don't want to be that person. Hallelujah. And the Bible says, and he shall not see when good comes. So even when good opportunities come, you cannot recognize it because you are used to this dry lifestyle. But he shall inhabit the patched places in the wilderness, in a salt land which is not inhabited. Imagine, that is why you now start feeling lonely and you start feeling alone. You start feeling secluded. You start feeling like God does not exist. Now you're suddenly saying, did you not say that you will not leave me nor forsake me? Where are you, God? Why are you not answering my prayers? Talk to me, somebody. Could it be that you are relying on your self-sufficiency instead of relying on the sufficiency of God? Talk to me, somebody. We will not rely on our self-sufficiency. We are not self-sufficient, but we, our sufficiency is of God. So what is this attitude of self-sufficiency, Pastor Fortune? What does it look like? Explain to me what does the self-sufficiency look like so that I can learn not to walk in that path, so that I can move away from that path of self-sufficiency. Somebody say, I will not be self-sufficient. I will rely on the sufficiency of God. Can we preach together? I need people who are going to preach with me. Oh, Jesus, you guys are already making me hot before we've gone into 15 minutes already. Hallelujah. The attitude of self-sufficiency looks like this. 
It is the kind of attitude that says you've got a confirmation. It is the, the confirmation of independence of God. Some people feel that they can do as they please, independent of God. You don't consult God and you are thinking you are independent. It's like when we leave our parents' homes and we say we are independent. There is no such thing as independence when it comes to a child of God. You will not be able to function. You will not be able to perform without God. You are supposed to be dependent on Him. He wants you to be dependent on Him. So anytime you are dependent on other things, you make those things your idol and He takes them away and then you start crying. Talk to me. What does the attitude of self-sufficiency look like, Pastor Fortune? It is a situation when people assume that things will happen for them by chance. God is not a God of chance. If you are going to have a, a, a good prayer lifestyle, it, it, God is not a God of chance. Somebody talk to somebody, take your neighbor and tell your neighbor, God is not a God of chance. We don't work by chances. This is not a luck. This is not tata my chance. This is not a lottery. Where you are saying, I'm taking chances, I don't know if you will answer, maybe you will answer, maybe you will not answer. No, God does not work like that. Self-sufficient people are thinking that life is a lottery, that they will just put whatever. Let's, let me just say whatever this woman says, I must say. Let me just pray whatever and, and, and make whatever declaration and just see. We will see. God is not a God of chance. God does not want you to approach him as if you are taking chances. You are taking chances, maybe he will do it, maybe he will not do it. Somebody say, I will not take chances with God. God is not a God of chance. It's not, it's not like chance, chance, like, let's see. No, 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 no. Yes, he will give you a second chance when you have messed up the first one. He'll even give you the third one or even the, th the tenth one, wherever you are. But he's not a God of chance. He doesn't want you to approach him as if you are chancing. You must approach him diligently saying, God, I know you're going to do it. What does self-sufficiency look like? What is this attitude that I'm being pre-warned about today? Hallelujah. It is the situation where, you know, um, people assume that their gifts, people assume that their abilities, people assume that their resources are responsible for their results. They are thinking that their qualifications are responsible for their results. Do you understand that there were equally 1,000 people that could have had the same job as you? Do you understand that when you have a qualification, for example, you've got a bachelor in commerce, there are thousands and billions of people or millions of people that have the same qualification. What makes you so, so different? What made you get selected? What made you get the job? What made you get voted? What made you, uh, your spouse choose you? Don't you see that there was something else extra? Don't you see that, was, that there was an extra blessing that was upon you that made you to be chosen? So you cannot rely on your resources. Some people who, are, who have an attitude of self-sufficiency, they're thinking that their wealth and their riches will, what is what will, will. There's one thing, that, let, me, let me make this illustration. That people who are rich or very wealthy, they soon discover that when illness hits them, everybody's equal. When you are, not, you are on that flight, right? Whether you are sitting in economy class, whether you are sitting in business class, whether you are sitting in first class, if the flight is going down and it's going to crash, everybody's going down. It doesn't matter how you shift everybody from first class and, 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 and you say, I'm in first class, I have to walk in first. Let me make this illustration in a different way. If you get the back seat in a flight, and you insist on rushing and you're pushing everybody out of the way. You're saying, I need to get in first. I'm, I, you, I, I need to be in the queue. The point is, when the flight descends and lands at the landing strip, the protocol says, they will open for first class to walk out first. They will open for business class to walk out first. They will open for everybody. But the point is that the flight lands at the same time. If I'm to enter in a flight from here, from Africa to the United States, the fact is when we land at, at, at JFK, we all land at the same time. The bags will be, will be taken out at the same time. It don't matter what your resources look like. When cancer hits, it hits everybody. Hallelujah. When cancer hits, your money will not be the one that saves you. So your sufficiency needs to be in God. When a person is praying for healing, for whatever disease, when you are praying and, and the doctor is giving, in that emergency room, in that theater, the prayer point is the same, darling. The, the, there is only one God. Everybody is praying to the same God. 
when life is about to go, when you're about to go out, the doctors in all their brilliance and in all their scientific wisdom, they start asking the family, is there anybody who's to give them the last rites? Talk to me. They might feel like they don't need God, but they need God's servants to give them the last Holy Communion before they check out of earth. They might feel like they don't need God, but everybody wants somebody. They want a spiritual person to be standing over there and, and pronouncing your last words to say, let your spirit go and depart, let soil go back to soil, whatever it said. Talk to me. Do you understand that you cannot be self-sufficient? We are all sufficient of, his, of, the, of God. You came from him. When you check out of this world, you will need him. That's when people, will people when they get married, they remember they need pastors. People when they die, they remember they need pastors. When things are down and they say the machine is not going to work in the ICU, they don't call anybody else. They ask the family, is there a pastor you want him to come? Call, call the pastor to come and pray. Hallelujah. From tonight, your life will not be hindered in Jesus' mighty name. Keep declaring in the comment section. You will no longer be hindered in prayer. You will not have a lifestyle of prayerlessness. Your lifestyle will be a prayerful lifestyle. My house shall be called a house of prayer. Forget all these other denominations and whatever we call ourselves and the names we give ourselves in ministries. The Bible says my house shall be called a house of prayer. Whether you like it or not. If you are a child of God, you have to pray. My house shall be called the house of prayer. So your gifts, your abilities, it's beautiful. You are gifted and all that, but that don't qualify you. Your abilities, yes, your resources, they, 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 they might be giving you some results, but they are not responsible. It is the blessing that comes because you are keeping a prayerful lifestyle. There is a blessing that comes and rests on you when you do what you are called to do, which is what? To pray. And what do you pray? You pray according to what he has said in the word. You pray according to the scriptures. So if you now begin to rely on self-sufficiency, it will re lead to sudden disaster. And you must avoid sudden disaster. Jesus, mighty God. Cursed is the man who trusts in, 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 in another man. Cursed is the man who trusts in another man, who trusts in his flesh. You will not see the good that comes if you, do, you are relying on other people. The second thing that self-sufficiency talks to is the arrival mentality that I've arrived. What will lead you in having a, 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 a lifestyle that is hindered, the, the, the lifestyle of prayer that is hindered, is that sense of having that I've arrived mentality. Revelations chapter 3 verse 16 to 17. Please, th those of you who are fast in typing, help me put up the scripture so that people can make a note of them. I like people who check me out so that they can check whether what I'm saying is aligned with scripture. Revelations 3 verse 16 to 17. The Bible says, So then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold or hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Jesus, my God. I love the word of God. It says, because you are lukewarm, you are neither cold nor hot. I will vomit you out of my mouth. God does not like people who are indecisive. God does not like people who are taking chances. God does not like people who don't trust him. People who are wavering back and forth, back and forth. Because you are neither hot nor cold, I will vomit you. God himself, he says, I will vomit you out of my mouth. I will reject you. Today you believe in me, tomorrow you don't believe in me. Today you are with me, tomorrow you are with Sangomas. Today you believe in me, tomorrow you are in a, in a shrine. Jesus. Somebody say, help me, Jesus. Help me, Jesus. I feel the Holy Ghost now. Mm. Because you say I'm rich, I have become wealthy and have need of nothing and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. That is what scripture says in Revelations 3 verse 16 to 17. The Bible says you do not know that you are wretched. You are not even aware that you have reached a state of misery. You don't understand that you have reached a state of poverty. That you are blind. That you are naked because you are relying on your wealth. My God. Those people who says, I've arrived, I've now arrived, I've got a Land Rover, I've got a Mercedes Benz, I've got my mansion, I don't need God, I need to party now, I need to get on going, I need to show myself off. And you forgot that these things would not have been possible by God, without God. You have forgotten, you think that it's your education. Wait until they make you, they fire you. Wait until the company doesn't do well. Wait until you come back on the queue. 
you will be back on the queue and you'll be doing prayer requests. Because at that time, Karabo Shoko Diaba. So God gives the warning. He says, you don't even realize your nakedness. You don't even realize that you are blind. You don't realize that you are poor. That is why some people, some wealth has been taken away. It was not the devil. That, or Rather, I should put it this way, that God allowed it to happen so that you can realize and come back to yourself and come back to your senses and understand that there is a certain way. I blessed you to be a blessing. Some people, they have things fall apart because they were not a blessing to other people. Let me move on, my God, because of time. Luke chapter 15, verses 13 to 15. My house shall be called a house of prayer. Thank you so much for those who are, who are, yes, let's declare it. Oh my God, you are in the spirit. My house shall become a house of prayer. If you're not happy with the current condition, ask yourself, is, the, is your house a house of prayer? Are you represent, because your body is the temple of God. Is your temple a house of prayer? Is prayer going on in your life? So when God looks at you right now, can he honestly say he's happy with you? Can you honestly say that prayer is happening in this house, in this temple? Or is complaining happening in your temple? And not many days after the younger son gathered all together, journeyed to a far country. I'm talking about the prodigal son now. I'm in Luke chapter 15, verses 13 to 15. He says the younger son gathered all together and journeyed to a far country. And there he wasted his possessions because we are so eager. We just want the money. We just want the goodies from God. And then we go out to countries that we don't know. And then we waste away. The Bible says the prodigal son wasted his life. He just lived recklessly. And after he had spent everything and he was left with nothing and he had to go back and he had to remember that he, there was now famine in his life. There arose a severe famine in that land and he began to have needs. He began to understand that he was in a poor condition. He went and joined himself to a city of that country and he sent him into the fields as a, to feed the swine. So he was now feeding pigs left a lifestyle where he was comfortable, left a lifestyle where he was protected and he was served. My God, my house shall be called the house of prayer. So what does the arrival mentality talk about, Pastor Fortune? Help me so that I can help myself tonight. The arrival mentality says, I've got the inability to stand the test of the blessing. Hallelujah. It means you, you are unable to stand the test of the blessing because the blessing will test you. When God empowers you, there will be a test. God gives you this thing so that he can test you. Immediately after the blessing arrives, you will be tested because some of you make vows to God and you don't keep them. You are very quick to say, God, if you bless me with a million dollars right now, God, this is what I will do. You even vouch to your pastor and say, Pastor, I will tithe. I've never tithed in my life. My, my dear, if you never tithed for a thousand dollars or you never even tithe on the ten dollars, you never gave one dollar to it, you are not going to give it to God even if you get one million. God knows us. God knows us. You pray, you make vows. God, if you give me this one, I I, I promise you through positive, I will do it. Somebody say, my house shall be called a house of prayer. My house shall be called a house of prayer. You want a million dollars, you will make every vow imaginable. I dare say some of you who are having any illness or any infirmity right now, you can make the biggest vow. That is why you are able to fall into a trap with the evil ones. Somebody can exchange and buy your soul. Because you are desperate, you, you want that healing. If I were to show up in some of your bedrooms or in some of the corners and tell you, okay, if you sell me your star, if you give me your soul, I will grant you your request. That cancer will be gone in one second. Do you understand that the devil can manipulate you to that extent? The devil can come and buy your soul and exchange your destiny and sell you things and make you forget that the, your, your, your body, your temple is a temple of God. He can make you a, 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 he ma experience hindrances to a prayerful lifestyle. Some people have exchanged their, their, their destinies for wealth and they stop praying to God. Come on, somebody. So your blessing, when it comes, it will be tested. Secondly, the inability to test, to, to stand the test of success. The inability to stand the test of success. 
My God. Somebody say it again and say, my house shall be called the house of prayer. Thank you so much, Jackie Princess. My house shall be called the house of prayer. Are you going to be able to stand the test of success? There is, a, there is what we call spirituality of adversity. <coughs> there is a spirituality of adversity where a person is very fireful. A person is very prayerful when they have little. But that type of spirituality is not the real spirituality because anybody can be humble. Anybody will be fireful and say, I am prayerful, I am believing God. And you, you, you are going through, right? You don't have much. You don't. You have little. So you are fi you are on fire for Jesus. You show up for evangelism. You are evangelist. You will do every single thing. You clean the chairs in church. You welcome people and you are nice. But that is not the true spirituality. There is a type of spirituality that God will come to examine when you reach the point of success. When you've arrived. When you think you've arrived. He will come and test your success that is why there's a quotation by abraham lincoln he says if you really want to know a person who a person is give them power come on somebody when you're suddenly the ceo in your workplace and suddenly you forgot that you used to do ushering in your in, in the kingdom of god when you're suddenly given a promotion with job now you're suddenly coming, carrying your big shoulders and behaving anyhow. And you are thinking everybody has to bow and, uh, from your, whenever you show up. Talk to me, somebody. Spirituality of adversity that will test your success. You will know who a person is until you give them power. Give them power, then you will know. There are some people that if God promoted them long ago, my God, people would be tortured in the workplace. People would be tortured because some people really, they don't understand that when you are promoted, you are put in a position of leadership. Am I communicating to somebody? Your position of leadership is demanding of, of a certain response, not for you to be bullying people around. You're not even knowing why you are bullying people. You think that leadership is about bullying people. You are bossing without any foundation. Come on, somebody. You're just shouting and, and swearing at people and doing everything, threatening with, to, to fire people left, right, and center. Who are you? My house shall be called the house of prayer. And you think God does not know the real you. God knows the real you. He knows exactly how you will behave if he gives you certain things. And that's why he, that is why you go into the processing room. I'm going to get there later. You are held back. Until you are processed, until your person gets your personality right, until your medulla bronchitis begins to communicate proper things. Because some of you, the things you have said, it's like when you say, Oh, what will happen if you win the lottery? Yo, I will just go into my workplace and they will know who I am. You see, God exactly knew that motive. That this is exactly who you will be. I will show them. God bless me with a car. Why? Because I want to go show off to my in-laws that I've arrived. And that's why certain things get delayed. Let me continue. Let me mind my business and continue. So God is still looking for those people that will still be fireful. When he takes them from nothing to become billionaires. He wants to see whether you will be consistent with zero and be consistent with the billions. But if he cannot see the right spirit and your motive towards how you will be at the billion stage, why should he trust you? Why should he give it to you? Because all you want to do, you want to show up. You're not going to share with anybody. You're not going to bless anybody anyway. That is why scripture says oh, you are blessed to be a blessing. These things are principled. This is a principle. Tune your mind right. Come on, somebody. Thank you for everybody who's following the accounts that, that you're on. So when prosperity will destroy your spirituality. It will invite calamity in your life. Let me say that again. I said something powerful. I say, when your prosperity destroys your spirituality, it will invite calamity in your life. The reason why you are seeing calamity for some people who are listening to me right now, it is because their spirituality has been destroyed. You have allowed your spiritual state to be destroyed. Talk to me, somebody opportunity and prosperity should actually increase you your and it should increase your spiritual intensity but other people when they get opportunity and they get prosperity then they they forget god it's a principle my house shall be a house of pro, of prayer 
My house shall be a house of prayer. And anytime you let your lifestyle of prayer be hindered, you are inviting calamity in your life because every, every time you are, you are moving away from a prayerful lifestyle, the devil begins to eat at you. The devil begins to make you lose sleep because now suddenly you are afraid. You are always under anxiety. Always, always are worried. Oh my God, they are bewitching me. Oh my God, they're going to get to me. People who, who, whose lifestyle, whose spiritual lifestyle is, is being destroyed, they are always afraid. They don't understand God because they have not been in fellowship and in communion with him. They think that prayer is coming with a list of requests that are 10 pages long. He knows what your needs are. He knows. And you think you just, just say, I'm just here to give a rundown of my list. No. So my question is to you, is, is opportunity and prosperity going to increase your spirituality or is it going to destroy it? Come on, somebody. Are you becoming spiritually intense? Are you growing in intensity? Or are you on a time frame and saying, God, if you don't answer me by the end of July, listen, yeah, you know, I'm not doing you. So the reason why God has not blessed so many people is because he does not want to lose them. He actually wants to keep them. Because he knows some, some of us are just only humble to the extent that we, we just, just, just keep me needing of God. Will he lose you if you were to prosper you? Yes. Yes, Mom Jester, prayer is not a shopping list. It's fellowship, it's communion with him. You need to, to, to just have a day or a session where you're just telling on, on him and romancing him and telling him how much you love him. Anything that you did to get in the realm of God, how you got to the place where you got to, you must continue to do that thing to remain there and to go up. For as long as you did certain things to get to a particular level, you keep on doing those things so that you go up to the next level as well. Talk to me. Oh, Jesus. Why is there a delay? My God. Discouragement from delay. People's lives are hindered. People's prayer lives are hindered because they've been discouraged from delay. They've allowed discouragement to creep in. They have lost hope. All you have is hope, guys. You have to hope that your expectation will not be cut off. But the problem is even other people don't even have expectations anymore because they don't believe and trust in God anymore. They don't even feel the need to hope anymore discouragement they're discouraged from delays because they've got their own timeline and god has his own timeline some of us we we, we behave like you know i i remember before i even got married we were behaving like we've got an expiry date you are not a cool baked beans uh, tin, tin of fish or whatever you don't have an expiry date and we believe like if we don't get married by a particular age oh my god this is catastrophic calamity is going to happen everywhere you do not have an expiry date Come on, somebody. Jesus. Am I communicating to somebody? I hope this is, I hope, I hope this is making somebody or helping somebody. And yes, the scripture says hope defend makes the heart sick. But we shouldn't lose. That's why Abraham says against hope, he believed in hope. Against hope, he believed in hope. Because sometimes, yes, the circumstances are such that it wants to make us lose hope. But we still go back to the same God. We still war. Hallelujah, somebody. So discouragement from delay is something that you should be careful about. Luke chapter 18, verse 1. It tells us about the parable of the persistent widow. And verse 1 says, Then he spoke a parable to them that men always ought to pray and not to lose heart. Let me encourage somebody who's listening to the sound of my voice today and say, do not lose heart. Can you encourage your neighbor and tell your neighbor, do not lose heart. Men ought always to pray. Pray always. Don't lose heart. Don't lose heart because in your prayer, in your communing with him, he's going to highlight to you the issues that you have got, you have missed on your path. He's going to highlight the things that you need to correct so that your hope is built up again. When you are in platforms like this, your prayer life is encouraged. When you hear of other people's testimonies, about you are encouraged, you start growing one more time. Ecclesiastes 3.11 says, there is a time he made everything beautiful in its time. There is a season for everything. So stop behaving like you're going to die if you're not maritally settled in this month. That is what makes people make mistakes. You end up with the wrong people. 
You end up in wrong relationships. You end up in wrong business deals because you were too much in the hiring. And God says, I make everything beautiful in its time. And I've also put eternity in their hearts, except that no one can find out the work that God does from the beginning to the end. You don't know what his plan was. Trust in his timeline. Trust in his milestones. Trust in his project plan. That these things will work out in its own time. Trust the fact that you don't have to compare yourself with the Joneses. You don't have to buy a car because your sister bought a car. You don't have to match up the house plan with the house plan next door. If your current state says you are building a one one flat house or one bedroom or one duplex, you do according... There's a timeline. God, is it right time for me to go? Is it right time for me to build? Is it the right time for me to get married? Can I afford to get married? Can I afford to, to, to raise these children? There are people who will just behave in any kind of lifestyle. They don't want to consult God. You will want to become a polygamous person. Others are polygamous even without marrying many people. But they will have children everywhere. You can't even take care of two kids. On the current budget you are on but you feel the necessity that you can have 17 kids with different mothers i know 17 is a bit exaggerated but i don't know some some people might have those numbers my god May God show you the right time. Come on, somebody. May God show you the right time to do things. Whoever touched that building without counting the cost, count the cost to everything that you're about to do. Don't just want it because of sake of wanting it. Can you afford it? Must you have a big wedding? Must you ask questions, ask questions, collect data. Don't just meet anybody and that person says, oh, show me that you can give birth first before I pay your lobola or your dowry or whatever you call it in your country. Why? Why, why must I show you that I can give birth first? Okay, let's go and get tested. But you, now you're going to give birth and this person is, is conditional and the person might not even end up marrying you. And you did not even collect enough data to find out whether he's financially able to support that child. Where does he come from? Does he have any children any some, somewhere else? That, that woman, is she having children elsewhere that she didn't tell you about? There's a right time. He makes everything beautiful in its time. In its own time. Count the cost to everything that you will do. Count the cost. He has a timing. Trust on his timeline. Talk to me, somebody. His timing is the best. His timing will not make you a desperate person. His timing will not make you bargain with the devil. His timing will not make you uh, get into the wrong in-laws without having... People don't collect data. I don't know why I'm talking to the relationships people so much tonight, but maybe there's a reason for that. Maybe there's somebody who's about to make the wrong decision. You've not investigated where this person comes from and you're about to tie up your whole entire life. I'm talking to somebody. I hear you, Holy Spirit. You don't know enough. Oh, God bless you, Shalene. Did you, what is dating? Dating is collecting data. Do you have enough data to make an analysis and then, and, 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 you know, a decision? Businesses collect data. They collect, they do research. Before we go into this country, before we venture into this business, what is the product? What, what is the, where is the competition? Who is the competition? How is the product performing in the market? Before they splash all the money. Collect data on human beings that are around you. Collect data on businesses that you are about to get into. Talk to me, somebody. So he makes everything beautiful in his time. Oh my God, let me rush quickly. 15 minutes. Job 14, 14 says, If a man dies, shall he live again? All the days of my hard service, I will wait till my change comes. Can we be patient enough? That we will not be discouraged by delays. And when we, be, we, when we are discouraged by delays, we then begin to lose focus and our lifestyle of prayer gets hindered. Oh, somebody say, confess it and say, my, my, my house shall be a house of prayer. I will be a house of prayer for God. I will not be discouraged by delay. Delay is not denial. Talk to me, somebody. John 1, 5, he says, the light shines in the darkness and the darkness does not comprehend it. The light shines in darkness until the light comes. You will not be coming out of that darkness. So you need to see the light until the word comes and takes root inside of you. Job 42 verse 10 says, And the Lord restored Job's losses when he prayed for his friends. Indeed, the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. Light had to come and shine on Job and give him a different strategy. Talk to me, somebody. 
So when answers delay in coming, people become slack at the place of prayer. I, I want somebody to declare in the comment section and say, I will not slack in my prayer life. I will not slack in my prayer life. Make sure you shout it seven times until it sinks in into your DNA and into your veins and into your genetic molecular cellular level and say, I will not slack in prayer. 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 Come on, somebody. I will not slack in prayer. Jesus, come on, somebody. So prayer, prayer, you need to understand that prayer is not just a platform. All of you on Facebook and YouTube. It's not just a, a platform to get things from God. This is not a shopping list. This is not a shopping mall. It's a platform for you to service your relationship with God. Play, prayer is not a platform for you to just come and get things from God. It's a platform for you to come and service your relationship with God. If your car does not get taken in for maintenance, it will not function at the junction. When your car does not go in for regular service, when the enemy attacks you, you will not know how to deal with it. You will not know how to, to fight witches. You will not know how to, to fight wizards. Come on, I will not slack in prayer. I will not slack in prayer. Come on, somebody. So you begin to understand that prayer is a platform for the rekindling of the spiritual fire. That spiritual fire that you lost, I command it right now to return to you. Somebody who's ready to repent truly this, this evening. It's returning to you right now in Jesus' mighty name. It is a platform for you to rekindle that spiritual fire. Tonight, make up a decision that my spiritual fervency is being rekindled. I'm praying, I'm going to start praying in the Holy Ghost. I'm going to rekindle that spiritual fire inside of me. So that I can deal with the demons that come and attack me. You don't have to wait for me to come up on the broadcast. You must be equipped. I'm equipping you to deal with those demons by yourself. And go help and liberate others in your family as well. So I will not be discouraged by delay. My God, delay is not a denial. Delay with God does not imply that he has refused your request. He might be asking you to check your, to check your request. Do you really want that thing? Do you really want that person? Are you sure he's the right one? Check your facts. So what are the understandings that we need to have about delay? We need to understand that there might be a timing issue. Whenever there's a delay, ask yourself, is it a timing issue, God? Is it that I'm not supposed to have this at the right time? Am I equipped to have this at the right time? Ecclesiastes 3.11, as I said, he says, he made everything beautiful in its own time. Secondly, when you're having delays in terms of answered prayer life, you check whether, is this a process issue? The first thing, is it a timing issue? Number two, is it a process issue? Am I being processed here? Am I in the valley for a processing? Am I being polished to be the right diamond to shine properly? Talk to me, somebody. Maybe what you are, you are trusting God for is, is, is ready for you, but you are not ready for it. You are trusting God, as I made the illustration, you are trusting God for a million dollars. Yes. And the million dollars is already there waiting for you, for waiting for you, for, 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 for the capital, for the business or whatever you are asking him for. But are you ready for it? Do you even know how to manage it? Whatever it might be. That is why they say whatever you are looking for is already looking for you. The question is, are you ready for it? Come on, somebody. Is it a process issue? Thirdly, you need to ask, is it a test of conviction? Because the delay might be because it's a test of conviction. What is conviction, Pastor Fortune? It is belief. It's the test of your belief. Do you really believe in me or you just came for the goodies? You came for the chocolates? Do you really believe me? Are you fully persuaded that I'm God? Am I Lord over your life? Are you fully persuaded that I'm your provider? Are you fully persuaded that I'm Elohim? Are you fully persuaded that I'm able, I'm able to provide everything you need? It's a test of conviction and it can also be a test of persistence to find out, are you persistent? Are you going to be consistent? If I hold on to you three months or three years, are you going to be consistent? Am I still going to be your God in three years time? If I don't give you that thing in the next three months, am I, am I still going to be your God? If I give it to your friend first, some of you have experienced this. You are praying for something, but it actually happens to a friend before. You are praying for something, but it actually happens to your sister before. Do you understand that you hold the spiritual authority? Do you understand? I want to teach something to people who are intercessors, that when things happen, 
for other people around you who are associated by you, uh, with you. You all need to understand that the blessings are happening because you are the bearer of the ark. You are the, the spiritual head. Some of you have been teaching you that in your families, you are the spiritual head. If it was not for you being there, some people would not be blessed in your family. So don't worry and, and wonder about denial or, or, you, or, or delay because your own is being reserved so that God is gathering the audience. He's gathering the cloud of witnesses that is going to witness you coming up and blooming up and say, my God, this is like a submarine coming out and, and just exploding. That is the level of your blessing. So everybody else is getting blessed around you. Don't panic. Don't be anxious for anything. If they are connected to you. They have to because you are the one who's bearing the ark. And the one who bears the ark is the one who bears the blessings. Talk to me, somebody. Jesus. I hope I've answered some of your questions. Some of you who came on this platform wondering, why is it that I'm believing God for this thing? But instead of it happening to me, it happened to my cousin. Pastor, I don't understand. Oh my God, the Holy Spirit is so much. I need to teach this thing. Oh, Jesus. And it's a weekday. Holy Spirit, take control, take control, take control so that I don't lose it. It's a test of conviction. That is why Job 14, 14 says, if a man dies, shall he live again? All the days of my heart service, I will wait until my change comes. God, I'm not moving until you change my situation. I'm not going to any other gods. I'm not going to serve any other gods. I'm not going to any other altar. I'm not going to any shrine. My God, maybe it's a test of light and insight. The insight failure. Maybe God wants you to have an insight why things are failing. Maybe God is waiting for you to receive the light in the same way. Hallelujah. The Bible says light shines in the darkness and the darkness does not comprehend it. You are going through a process and a season of darkness right now and you don't see the light at the end of the tunnel. You don't see the light at the end of the tunnel. Why am I not seeing it, Pastor Fortune? It's because I'm not even in the word. I'm not even in a prayerful lifestyle. I'm not praying. Somebody Jesus, deliver, 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 deliver. My God, my God, oh my God. Mm. Maybe it's a direction issue. Am I being delayed because it's a direction issue? I need to receive direction. Oh Jesus, oh Jesus. Karabashoto kodemeshe kediya bahasa. Is it a direction issue, God? Did I miss something? Did I miss an instruction? Job 42, 10, he says, And the Lord restored Job's losses when he had prayed for his friends. Indeed, the Lord gave Job, Job twice as much as he had before. If Job had missed the direction to pray for his friends, his friends would not have given them half of his wealth. God gave him double. Come on, somebody. Maybe it's a strategic step that must be taken that God wanted you to go through. Come on, somebody. Why am I being delayed, Pastor Fortune? Why does it look like my answer to my prayers are being delayed? It could be that there is a lifestyle of compromise and guilt. Are you laboring under a lifestyle of compromise? Are you compromising certain things? Are you feeling guilty of certain things? Talk to me. Proverbs 28, 1 says, The wicked flee when no one pursues them, but the righteous are as bold as a lion. The reason why certain people cannot make any prayers or any commands or demands or declarations is because they are feeling guilty. They know that they have compromised themselves. And as I've said before, it's easier to rebuke a demon out of any person rather than to rebuke a principality. In an atmosphere of principalities, you need to argue principles because the, the devil who is the accuser of the brethren will be there saying, no, 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 you are not entitled to this because principle, God's word says this, this is why that must happen. You're going to need the mercy of God to get you out of that mess at that point. Jesus, I hope somebody is, is, is learning something tonight. So are you in, the, that's why the Bible says in Proverbs 28, 1 says, the wicked flee when no one pursues them. People are running away from God. Because why? The wickedness mentality, the garment of wickedness has come on them. They are feeling guilty. They know that they've compromised themselves. They are afraid to go before God because they feel impure, because they have now tarnished themselves. I want you to remember that he, he, at the point, there was a point where you actually went to God and you said, God, here are all my sins. I want to be born again. And then there was a point where he washed your garments and they were clean as white as snow. He washed them with the blood of Jesus. I want you to remember that there's a point where you can always go back to your father and repent. There is a point when you can go back and say, God, I'm sorry. 
Don't let your life, your, your life wither away because you are feeling that you've compromised. Yes, you have fallen so many times and you have gone back and said, God, give me another chance. Give me another chance. For as long as you have breath in your life, do not allow yourself to check out of this earth without having said, God, I'm sorry. I compromised myself. I backslid it. And I'm feeling guilty. But I want you to take away my guilt. Lord, I'm sorry. Because I want my prayers to be answered. Please do not wait. use crying emojis, my darlings. Lord, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. And I'm back here again, God. I don't want guilt to take me far away from you that I don't feel that I can come back to you and pray. I need to restore my standing with you, God. Can somebody, if you need forgiveness in your life tonight, I want to tell you that God's forgiveness is available for you. So somebody say, God, forgive me. I want you to declare it in the comment section. Other intercessors are also praying with you and they will help you understand. They will be praying with you so that we are taking you back. We are repossessing you back into the kingdom of God. We're not going to allow you to wither away. Come on, somebody. So we need to watch out for the lifestyle that is sinful because of sinfulness. Sinfulness is sort of like a line. It's mutually, sinfulness and prayerfulness is, is, is mutually exclusive. So you cannot be prayerful while you are being sinful. But if you really truly say, I want to be prayerful, you're going to have to turn your back on sin. You're going to come back and, and you say, God, I repent. I want to live, to stop this lifestyle of sin because I want to be prayerful. So you, you begin to understand that sin and pr sinfulness and prayerfulness cannot exist mutually. They are mutually exclusive. They are diametrically opposed to each other. Sinful living makes prayer flow difficult. You don't flow. That's why you feel like the Holy Spirit is not communicating with you. You're not flowing. You can't hear for yourself. You constantly need confirmation. And you might end up asking for confirmation in the wrong places. And that's why I'm, I'm here to stand in the gap with you tonight. In Jesus' mighty name. The Lord has given you another chance. When a person insists on a lifestyle of sinfulness instead of a lifestyle of prayerfulness, sinfulness punctures confidence. People cannot approach God. They cannot come boldly to the throne of grace with confidence. People who are sinful are, don't have confidence. They lack boldness to come in the place of prayer. If you have boldness in the place of prayer, you can rebuke demons. You can rebuke principalities and tell them where exactly to go. You can talk to your situations and recreate your world. May God give you restoration of your boldness in Jesus' mighty name. I pray for every single person of the sound of my voice right now in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Your prayer life is, rest is being restored. You will flow again. Your spirit life, you will flow again. You will hear from God again. You will dream again. You will start seeing visions again in Jesus' mighty name. Thank you, Jesus. I need you to understand that the reason why there's been some delays, Karaba Shoto Kodiaba is because you are facing satanic resistance. When you, in, you, when you are living a lifestyle of sin, you are inviting the resistance from the devil because every time you are standing up there and you are saying, I'm declaring, I'm confessing this, but the thing keeps on resisting you because the devil is saying, no, 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 you don't have a right to say that. Let me point this out for you in scripture. Zechariah chapter 3 verse 1 to 4. Zechariah chapter 3 verse 1 to 4, he says, Then he showed me Joshua, a high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right hand to oppose him. And the Lord said to Satan, The Lord rebuke you, Satan. The Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebukes you. Is there not a brand plot from the fire? Verse 3 says, Now Joshua was clothed with filthy garments and was standing before the angel. Look at verse 3. Thank you those who are following me. Thank you so much. Please make sure you're following the platform and make sure you're following us on YouTube as well. Amen, somebody. All the details are in the profile so that you can watch the replay because I believe we can deliver a lot more people if they can hear this truth. Thank you so much, guys. Thank you so much. Verse 3 says, Joshua was clothed with filthy garments and was standing before the angel. This is the prophet Zechariah who's traveling and he's taken, he can see that Joshua is standing before God, the Holy One. He's standing in a holy place, but he's wearing filthy garments. And the Satan comes and accuses and says, wait a second. You have said nobody can, can come with filthy garments on holy ground. But here is Joshua wearing filthy garments. 
Verse 4 says, he answered and spoke to those who stood before him and saying, take away the filthy garments from him. And to him, he said, see, I have removed your iniquity from you and I will clothe you with rich robes. Let me expatiate on this issue. Anytime you participate in a sinful type of lifestyle, you wear a particular garment. So anytime you participate, for example, let me make this illustration. If you are wearing, a, you, you appear before God and you just committed adultery, the devil has a right to come in and say, hey, this one is wearing a filthy garment, not entitled, not entitled. How can, how can she be praying to marry a, a person who's already married? Something is wrong here, Jesus. Mm -mm. This cannot be for the sake of time. I'm not going to go into too much deeper in that. Zechariah 3 verse 1 to 4. You go and meditate on that scripture. Why, why, why is there delay? Could it be that you are lacking discipline and you are lacking diligence? Some people's prayers are not answered because they lack discipline and they lack diligence. Genesis 19, 27 says, And Abraham went early in the morning to the place where he stood before the Lord. Come on, somebody. When we wake up at 5 a.m., we wake up, not, our bodies don't want, the flesh doesn't want. Other people would rather get the glory in other ways, but we say, God, we just want the morning glory. We want the morning dew. We want to make sure we catch you early. Psalm 55 verse 17 says, Evening and morning and at noon time I will pray and cry out loud and he shall hear my voice. This is what the psalmist is saying. Psalms 55 verse 17, he says, I will come and pray to you in the morning, in the noon time, in the night time. Every time I will make sure that God hears my voice. Talk to me, somebody. God showed up for Daniel in Daniel chapter 6 verse 10. He says, now when Daniel, that the writings were signed, he went home and he went into his upper room. He went and he, he, he opened his windows, opened towards Jerusalem. He knelt down on his knees and three times that day and prayed, gave thanks before God. And this was his custom as in early days. So this needs to be a practice. This needs to be an ordinary practice on how you are doing things diligently. Pray diligently. Show up diligently. Don't just pray only when you wish. For those of you who are still struggling with certain things, I don't care whether you have the hangover or not. If you are used to praying at a particular time, create a pattern. Until we deliver you from every other thing, you create a pattern. You show up and you show up for God. You show up in the morning, show up in the noontime. There is no, you cannot wait up for, some of you have been wait, you, you've left your children to be attacked by the enemy because you ain't praying for them. Can I pray, can I bring correction to some parents? Parents, you don't pray well enough for your children and probably I need to repent as well. I need to check whether I've been praying for my child long enough. There has to be a pattern of prayer, Mom Chester. That's a, a, true. A pattern of prayer. You have to have a pattern of prayer. The same way you have a... It's not enough. After you have listened to me, after you've gone back to YouTube, do you have your own time where you go and meditate? Meditate on the word. What was this woman saying? Look at the scriptures again. When last did you open your Bible? Don't just have an electronic Bible. Also have a physical Bible. Because in case the internet goes, oh, there's no electricity. Like now we've been not having electricity. Imagine if we didn't have physical Bibles. Have a pattern of how you are fellowshipping with God. Talk to me. So if you're going to have a functional spiritual life, you need to have diligence and discipline in your life. Talk to me, somebody. You need to have a functional spiritual life. You're going to have to have what? Diligence. And you're going to have to have discipline. And the most important thing of life that you will require is discipline. In life, you require discipline. Somebody type discipline in the comment section. I will be disciplined. I will be disciplined in Jesus' mighty name. Without discipline, there is no destiny, children of God. Saints, without discipline, there is no destiny. Somebody say it. Without discipline, there is no destiny. Without discipline, there is no destiny. What separates the other people who are looking like they're making it in life? Discipline. Discipline will wake you up in the morning. If you can't wake up to even pray to God, are you even going to show up on time if when he gives you that job you're believing him for? Discipline. Where there is no diligence, there is no excellence. People who are not diligent, they don't bring out excellence. So they, they can't even be promotion because there's nothing excellent. 
So if you want a lifestyle of excellence, you're going to have to be diligent. That means you're analytical. You are paying attention. You are you are woke. You are paying attention. Why are certain things not happening? I need to fix this. I need to do this at this particular time. I will be diligent. Can somebody just... Don't worry, my darling. That person who says, this is personal to me. This is, this is for you. If I came this the evening, I asked to be on this broadcast this evening. I felt a burden to just come and teach today. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Father, I will have an excellent life. I will lead an excellent life in Jesus' mighty name. Thank you for those who have just joined as well. Thank you so much, guys. Welcome to the family. This is a family. This is a house of prayer. This is a protocol breaking prayer platform. We teach the word. We pray the word. We stand for each other. We karabashoto kodiabahasata. Could it be the reason why your, your prayers are not being answered is that you have lack, you lack fire and passion. You have lost the fire and the passion. Romans 12, 11 says, not lagging in diligence, fervent in spirit and serving the Lord. Have you stopped serving the Lord? What was that thing that made you serve God? That has made you, where is the fire in serving God? Where is the fire that made you fervent in spirit? Where is the fire that made you lose? You, you are now lagging in diligence. You are slack. You are not diligent. Come on, somebody. Hallelujah. Amos 6, 1, he says, Woe to you who are at ease in Zion. Do you understand that? This is not an easy peasy, I'm relaxed, I'm slack in everything. No. Proverbs 4, verse 23 says, Keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it comes issues of life. Keep your heart with all diligence, because out of it flows the issues of life. Don't allow things that creep in gossip, people talking to you anyhow, telling you anyhow about your Christianity, telling you anyhow about your God, and then you begin to lose passion, and your heart, you are not diligent with what goes into your heart. Watch what you hear. You hear too much doom, everything about Satan. Then you don't see the magnificence of God, the bigness of God over your problems. Come on, somebody. You need to understand that if you, are, if you are prayerful, it means you are fireful. If you are not fireful, that means you are not prayerful. If you are not prayerful, may the Lord give you understanding. I'm, I'm so sorry. Hallelujah. In Jesus' mighty name, I will be prayerful. Somebody de declare, I will be prayerful and I will be fireful. Come on, somebody. I will be prayerful and I will be fireful. Hallelujah. You need to understand that your intake will affect your fire. What you take in affects your fire. If you're always around negative people, what you are intaking will affect your fire. You cannot be fireful if you're always taking in negativity. You're always taking in gossip. You're always taking in fear. You're always taking in people. People who are just always talking nonsense. Be careful what you take in. It determines your outflow. So what is flowing out of you? Your fruits, where you currently are in your life, it is because of what you took in. We can tell exactly where you are with what you are taking in. When anyone sends even a prayer request, I make sure you, you, you phrase your prayer request right and say, God, I thank you. This week I'm believing you for a job. This week I'm believing you for health in this area. And thank you, Jesus. An attitude of thanksgiving. Hallelujah. But first, we have to build fellowship. Be careful what you take in. It determines your outflow, what is flowing out of you. Could it be that your prayers are not being answered because you lack faith and trust in God? Somebody say, I will not lack faith and I will not stop trusting God. Hebrews eleven six 6 says, but without faith, it is impossible to please God. He who comes to God must believe that he is and he is the reward of him that faithfully, diligently and seek him. He rewards those who diligently seek him. Talk to me, somebody. When you get to the book of Acts chapter 12, verse 1 to 8, the Bible tells about Herod, how Herod was opposing the church and how Herod had, had killed James, the brother of John. And now he was going after Peter, the disciple. Hallelujah. For the sake of time, I'm not reading that entire scripture. Hallelujah. That is why I'm giving it to you to read later. Acts chapter 12, verse 1 to 8. So I'm going to paraphrase it. So here comes King Herod. He kills James, the brother of John, with a sword. And then because he saw that he pleased the Jews, he proceeds. Now he wants to take Peter also. He gets Peter arrested and he was about to do the same to Peter and get him killed. But thank God for intervention. So imagine if you are part of Jesus' team and you are part of the disciples and you saw somebody else getting killed. And you're thinking, yo, if God did not show up for James, is God going to show up for me? Lack of faith. And you stop trusting God. 
But thank God, as you track later in verse 5, the angel comes while Peter is sandwiched in jail, chained to the floor with, with, with guards on, on both sides and guards at the door of the jail. And the angel comes and pokes him and says, Hey, when I stand up and put on your sandals, put on your garment, let's go, it's time. It's time for freedom. Probably Peter was not expecting that. People who don't trust God, who lack faith, they don't even expect God to show up for them. But I'm here to, to resound this and make sure this is sounding. And you are going to go to bed and rest and know that God is sending the angel to rescue you. I'm waking up your angels and your destiny helpers so that they can help you, so that you don't lose hope. Per adventure, you find yourself in captivity and you are looking around and you are seeing chains. You will not lose hope in Jesus' mighty name. Thank you, Jesus. He says, casting all your cares upon him. He cares for you. 1 Peter 5, 77. Cast all your cares upon him. What is troubling you? Put your cares on him. Oh my God, I need to finish. You cannot pray doubting God. You cannot pray doubting God. You cannot say you are having a prayerful lifestyle where you are not you, you are not expecting answers. If you are expecting answers, you cannot doubt God. Could it be that your prayers have not been answered because your faith is 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 not fired by light and insight? You need to receive light, receive light and insight in your life. Hallelujah. One of the highest realms that you're going to have is is is, is when you get to a point where you can sleep, and the enemy has been trying to attack you. I'm closing now. The enemy has been attacking and thinking that he's going to make you lose sleep. But here comes God. And he says, rest. Why should you lose sleep? And the devil is busy sleeping. The Bible says there's no rest for the wicked. You are not the wicked. Thank you, Jesus. Sorry, I saw that message. Those of you on Mara Official, please, um, we will give you a link to follow if you want to follow me on TikTok and you follow me on YouTube. And on my TikTok, there is a WhatsApp group as um, barcode. You can scan the WhatsApp group and be part of the WhatsApp group. Then I'll be able to communicate with you. That lady who just asked me the question there. So there's a point where you reach in the realm of faith, where you can sleep. And you know that you are in charge. And you know that God is taking care of the devil and his attacks, whatever he's doing around you so i want to implore you and ask you don't allow the devil to cause you to lose sleep tell your neighbor don't lose sleep god is on my matter god is mattering my matter don't lose sleep don't lose sleep so when you go to rest tonight i want you to know that when you go to rest god goes to work he never sleeps no slumbers so God is at work. So you can go back to bed and rest tonight. And from this night forward, you go to rest. And because God is going to work, don't lose sleep. Rest. Tell your neighbor rest from tonight. Actually, don't even depend on your neighbor. Don't touch your neighbor. Don't tag your neighbor. Tag yourself and put your name there and say, Fortune, rest. Can we declare it right now as we close in prayer? And say, Fortune, you will rest from today. My prayer life is being restored. Call your name, rest, Kwan, rest, Mutoni, rest, rest, Doreen, rest, Melissa, rest, Brenda, rest, Chido, it's time to rest. God is at work, God is, is busy. Rest, when you get to a point where you are resting, you are now functioning in revelation, you are in a different dimension. You don't lose sleep because Jesus is at work. You stop panicking, you've already committed the matter to God. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for every single person that has showed up for this broadcast tonight. Father, thank you for the teaching of the word, Lord, that the word shall be rooted inside of them and they will take it and they will grow from that platform in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord, that prayer lives have been restored and rekindled. Fires and passions have been rekindled in Jesus' mighty name. Thank you, Lord, for using me as a vessel, my God, as a point of contact, my God, that somebody knows that they don't have to lose hope, that they can continue, that there is a life that is waiting for them, a life that is beautiful in its own season, in its own time, in Jesus' mighty name. Father, I declare and I decree over everybody who is listening to the sound of my voice as I stand in the gap and I declare it for myself and my family as well, that we receive the light and the revelation. We receive the insight from your word that has been preached tonight in Jesus' mighty name. Father, we receive the light and revelation. If you want to concur with me you can say amen and make sure your amen is thundering or you can thunder the declaration back to you as i'm declaring and prophesying it in jesus name father i prophesy that revelation has come 
And that revelation will cause a light to shine. That revelation will cause insight to come on everyone who's at the sound of my voice tonight. And Father God, you are causing every single person that is at the sound of my voice, you will cause them to sleep and be at peace and know that you are at work. Nobody will lose sleep anymore. Nobody will be in, will have insomnia issues anymore in Jesus' mighty name. Father, I speak to the spirit of depression that has been causing other people to be having sleepless nights. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, Holy Spirit, I thank you. I decree and I declare rest. Somebody type on rest and shout that amen. Rest in Jesus' mighty name. Father, tonight you will cause us to rest while you go to work on the devil for our sake. The devil will no longer keep us awake in Jesus' mighty name. You will rest and God will give you results in Jesus' mighty name. Father, whatever will cause us to rest so that you can... Whatever will cause the devil to stay awake, do that thing, oh God. Let the devil stay up and be restless, but I will not be restless in Jesus' name. That thing that will cause the devil to be restless. That thing that the devil thought that will make you be laid to rest. The God is going to lay that devil to rest. They will be laid to rest. Whoever is gathered for your sake, they shall scatter. And they shall be laid to rest for your sake. You are going to rest peacefully. My God, thank you, Jesus. Father, I declare and I decree that everybody who's at the sound of my voice, <coughs> They will connect with the revelation of rest. Father, and in their resting, they will have divine visitations in Jesus' mighty name. As they connect to their rest, my God, they will have results in Jesus' mighty name. God bless those who are gifting. God bless you and increase you. Father, as we connect to the revelation of rest, Father God, we thank you, Lord, that you are opening our eyes. You are opening our ears, oh God. You are opening our understanding to that revelation in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. And that revelation is giving us results. Father, we receive results. We will not be restless. We will be restful. We will be prayerful. We will be fireful in Jesus' mighty name. My God. I don't know if you ever came across the scripture in 1 Samuel chapter 11 verse 9. The Bible says, And they said to the messengers who came, Thus you shall say to the son of men, to, to the men of Jabesh Gilead, Tomorrow by the time the sun is hot, you shall have help. Can I read the scripture again? Because this is important for this prayer that I'm about to pray. They said to the messengers who came, 1 Samuel chapter 11 verse 9, Thus you shall say to the men of Jabesh Gilead, tomorrow by the time the sun is hot, you shall have help. So the Lord is saying, no matter how hot it feels, and I'm going to put this into context, whatever you're feeling like, you've been feeling like you're on hot coals. He says, tomorrow by the time the sun is hot, you shall have help. So whether it's heating up, whether it's the sun of poverty that is trying to heat up, God says you shall have help. Then the messengers came and reported to the men of Jabbath and they were glad. So father, whatever is the sun that is hot over your people, over your children, over different nations that are represented on this broadcast, my God, father, thank you for sending help. Can somebody declare with me and say, thank you for sending help. Thank you for sending help because I've been burning. I've been burning in depression. The sun of depression has been heating up on me. Thank you for sending help. Thank you, Jesus. Father, the sun is hot over our lives. Father, many are facing the sun of insecurity, the sun of adultery, the sun of kidnappings, the sun of rapes, the sun of recessions, the sun of financial lack, the sun of poverty, the sun of corruption, the sun of dysfunctional families in Jesus' mighty name. Father, and we decree and we declare that we are asking you to send help and to open up the gates of blessings, open up the gates that will take away the heat, my God, take away the scorching heat. Thank you, Lord. I decree that the siege is over. Whatever has been telling you that you are under siege, the siege is over in Jesus' mighty name. Thank you, Jesus. The siege is over. Can you declare it with me and say the siege is over? Thank you for those who are following. God bless you. Welcome to the family. 
Father, visit our lives tonight. Visit our churches. Visit our families, oh God. The siege is over. Father, thank you for sending us help to break the siege. Whatever has been, we've been under siege, oh God. We feel like we're under siege. We are receiving notices of evictions. We are receiving notices of repossessions. We feel we, 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 we are not getting answers to our visa applications. Whatever it is that has been making you feel like you're under siege. The Holy Spirit says the siege is over. Father, many are waiting for promotions. Many are waiting for jobs just to be allocated. Father, I decree that the siege is over in Jesus' mighty name. Father, I pray that you send help. Send the divine visitation that they need. Father, send the correction and the realignment with the prayerful lifestyle that they need to, to, to fix my God in Jesus' name. Thank you, Jesus. Somebody say, thank you, Lord, for divine intervention in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord, for divine intervention. Every single person that is represented on this broadcast receive the divine intervention of the Lord. Minently, the siege is over for you in Jesus' name. I prophetically declare that the revelation light has come on you. You will have genuine sleep and genuine rest in Jesus' mighty name. Everything that the Father in heaven has not planted in your body, I speak to those people who are sick in their bodies right now. Anything that God did not plant in your body, I command it to be flushed out in the name of Jesus Christ. I speak to that person with a blood condition. You're on Facebook. Father, flush out that disease. Flush it out, Father God. Bring that correction in Jesus' mighty name. 